it's like a handful of people here in person. I think we have a maybe 10 or so online. So it's a pretty good turnout. Thanks for joining us on this beautiful Saturday, windy Saturday morning. Uh, my name is Jennifer Cook. I'm the Gilpin County CSU Extension Director. So I also run the community garden. I see some gardeners here today. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, so today we're really just gonna dig a little deeper into soil, kind of talk about, um, just nerd out a little bit on soil, understand some qualities around soil that we're looking for. Um, soil testing, we'll talk about organic matter and fertilizers amendments. So we have a lot to talk about today. Um, uh, Derek, do you wanna introduce yourself too? Yeah, thanks Jennifer. My name is Derek Lowstuder and I'm the agriculture and food systems specialist for uh, CSU Extension for Extension's mountain region. So I serve 13 mountain counties from pretty much kind of Custer Chafee up to Jackson County. Um, and Gilpin is included in that, which I'm really thankful for. So thanks again for coming out. Uh, if at any point you have any questions, feel free to, to ask them. Uh, you know, we want to try to take advantage of uh, the informality and um, kind of the, the flexibility that we have in this space. So um, let us know if you have any questions or if you need anything from us. Cool. And uh, Becky is in the back just managing the chat. So if we have chat questions, We'll have some time kind of like a break in the middle and um, Becky can ask any of those. Or if you want to raise your hand, we can, um, Becky can tell me that your hand is risen, is raised, raised, <laughs> risen, not, not risen, raised. Um, and we you can ask it and we'll be able to hear you hear over our loudspeaker. Michael, are you recording this for us? Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, well, let's just go ahead and get started. Let me see if I can hide this. Muted. Yeah, now it's not moving. Oh, oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, so an overview of what we're going to talk about today. We'll talk about what is soil. Hey, Harv. Uh, we'll talk about some mountain soil characteristics, what type of soils we want for gardening. Um, amendments, fertilizers, and basically in the end, we'll have given you 10 top tips for having healthy soils or things to think about. So you'll have 10 tips to take away from the day. Um, so what describes a good soil? I'm gonna take that slide away so you guys can tell me. If you're online, you can just put it in the chat. What do you think describes a good soil? And maybe a couple of folks here in person can just yell out, what makes a good soil? Good drainage. Good drainage. <clears throat> Any other thoughts? Good growth. <laughs> good growth. Yeah, productive. I heard worms. So like the or, the organisms that are living in the soil. Yeah, we have lots of good ideas. I have nutrients from online. Online nutrients. Great. Let's look at this list. Drains well, soaks up water without runoff, stores moisture during drought. Um, has no hard pans, resists erosion and nutrient loss, produces healthy crops, lots of organic matter and soil organisms. So those are just some descriptors that we're gonna think about today. So like how, how can we make our soils better and, and ideal like these descriptions? First, just real quick, how are soils formed? You probably all know this from your, um, from elementary school. Uh, <laughs> no, they forget. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, so basically it's our bedrock that over thousands of years is breaking down through, you know, freezing, thawing, weather, rain, snow, um, plants and trees growing into the rocks and breaking it down. Um, animals like worms living and moving the soil around, breaking it down a little bit more, helping decay everything. So just over thousands of years, our soils are formed. So it's not something we should take lightly because they do say, take so long to form. So um, it's not just dirt, it's soil. <laughs> uh, let's see. So at, over these thousands of years that soils are forming, they create horizons. So just this is just a little background information for you. 
So um, soils create these layers. Um, the top layer is usually the organic matter. So that's maybe like zero to 5%. Um, around here, I don't know, it depends. Maybe you have, you know, 1% or something of like needles and leaf matter breaking down. And then you have other layers. So here's some two, uh, two horizons that we can kind of compare to see um, how different soils can be. The one on the left, it looks like it's pretty clay. It looks like the orange, the third layer down is orange and probably all the nutrients or the iron from the, that gray middle layer has leached down into that third layer and is just sitting there. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and then the one on the right is more cobbly. That might be one that would look more like our soils, unless we're in like a really wet um, you know, uh, clay soil here, which is possible up here. Um, so which of these soils do you think would drain better? Probably the one on the right. Probably the one on the right, yeah. And then the one on the left, do you think that would probably hold a lot more water? Yeah, I think so too. So texture has a lot to do with, you know, starting to think about what our soil characteristics are like. So I just want to tell you really quickly about the web soil survey. So NRCS, which is part of USDA, they have um, a soil survey, soil information for everywhere pretty much in the United States. And if you go in here, you click start, and then if you navigate by address, you can click, you type your address in and it will zoom into your area. And then you have to kind of draw a line or a polygon to outline it. And then it will tell you lots of cool information about your spot. So I just did a really quick one for my property, which is pretty close to here. So I, it tells me uh, my soil profile, the organic matter is zero to one inches deep. <laughs> Sounds about right. Um, and then the one to five inches below that is very gravelly, sandy loam. And then five to 18 inches below that is gravelly, very gravelly, loamy sand. And then below that is weathered bedrock. So that might be helpful if I wanted to maybe dig a garden and then I would know what I'm what I'm up against, right? Um, another cool thing about this, it also tells me my annual precipitation. So if I'm new to the area and want to know how much rain or snow we get, 17 to 25 inches, mostly in snow, as we all know. Um, and then the frost-free period, which is cool if you're trying to garden up here and you're new and wondering what you can grow, 25 to 85 days. Not very long. We all know that. We, we It's a whole nother topic to talk about gardening. Um, but yeah, so that's just kind of interesting. I wanted to show you about that resource that you can utilize. Uh, okay, back to soil. So what are soils made of? They're made of three different types of minerals, um, either sand, silt, or clay, or a combination of, hopefully a combination of all three, and then water, air, and organic matter. So that's totally what it's made of. So this is a pie chart of a loamy soil, which is our most ideal kind of soil that we could grow in. There's you know plenty of space for water and air. If we had a really sandy soil in a pie chart like this, it would have less space for water, less space for air. So the minerals, sand, silt, and clay are basically what your soils are made of. Sand, a single particle of sand, you could see that with your naked eye. Silt and clay, you need a microscope to see the actual like single particle of them because they're so small. And you can see the clay, as you probably might guess, it's more of like a platy um, type of, cre it creates like a platy surface area, um, which is why our clay soils don't drain very well, right? because they're platy, but it's also a place where um, it creates a habitat for microorganisms and for chemical reactions to take place. So it's not all bad to have some clay. This is a soil uh, textural triangle, and this is just a way that soil scientists are organizing types of soils based on the percentages of so sand, silt, and clay. So we have on the left side, the percentage of clay, the right side, the percentage of silt, and on the bottom, the percentage of sand. And if you were to send a soil test to the lab, they could use different size sieves to figure out the percentage of your sand, silt, and clay, and they could give you your soil texture. Um, you could also do this by feel. 
Uh, if you get your if you get your um, soil wet and rub it in your fingers, you could tell if it's really gritty, then it's pretty sandy. If it's like slippery, almost like wet baby powder, then it's silty. And if it's sticky, then it's pretty clay. Um, but anyway, we want this loam. So the kind of mid the purple middle circle there is the the loam that we want to have that's ideal. So that's the um, you know, 50% sand, looks like 20% clay and, you know, let's see, like 80% silt. That might be a good loam. So the purple and then the green outer circle, those are all the kind of soils that you can work with that are pretty easy and amendable. Once you get up to like really totally clay or totally sand or totally silt, those are soils much harder to work with. So hopefully um, that's not the case for you. And if it is, building raised beds is a fine option, especially up here. So our mountain soils can be described as broken rock and fine and gravelly, sandy alluvial river bottoms, marshy and clay soils with bad drainage, um, shallow to bedrock, and cold soil temperatures, short growing season. <laughs> so, um, but it's interesting to note though that um, the soil that we do have here, it's totally sufficient for native plants. So if you're just looking to do native plants, um, all the trees and, and plants that are growing around us are native and natural and they're fine in that they're sufficiently growing in this soil without any amendments. What we're mostly talking about today is if you're trying to grow food, for like, like vegetables and gardening type food or flowers that aren't necessarily native. That's, that's what we're talking about today. So that's the context. And that's when you would need to, you know, really worry about amending your soil um, and fertilizing possibly. We'll learn more about that. But just so, just so you know, in the context of this, native plants are fine with our soils. You don't need to worry about amending anything if you're doing natives. Um, back to soil texture. So we learned, we've learned already, hopefully, that soil texture really influences our in water intake rates, our water storage capacity, the amount of aeration the soil has, and ultimately the soil fertility. So again, let's look at these two pictures, not the best pictures, but um, you can see the one on the left is more of a platy structure, and then the one on the right is more granular. So which do you think would um, hold more soil or more water? Left. The one on the left, left. yeah. Yeah. And then granular would probably drain a lot quicker, but it would probably grow carrots a lot better or potatoes. <laughs> um, also, we need to think about the living soil. So there's lots of microorganisms living in the soil, nematodes, you know, like thousands of these in just a tablespoon, hopefully, if your soil is really healthy. And that's, we're going to talk about some tips today to keep your soil healthy. We really want these organisms here because they're working to break down nutrients, cycle nutrients, and really are supporting the, our plants and, our, and their plant growth. Um, notice we also have, you know, worms and bulls and pocket gophers. As much as we don't like pocket gophers and bulls, they are do, playing their part in the soil ecosystem and the soil food web. They're tilling the soil and, you know, breaking up, creating air pockets, breaking up any compaction. So they're doing, they're doing a job. Do you want to say anything more about soil, the soil food web? Sure, and I mean we'll we'll go into different aspects of this in more detail. But the way that I kind of like to think about the soil, a healthy soil, is that it's a it's an economy at different scales, and so you have different microbes uh, and different uh, larger organisms that have different roles, and so they might have multiple jobs. But there might be some microbes that fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere. There's other ones that are going to make a phosphorus more soluble and easier for plants to take up. And then uh, the common currency for most things is sugar. So we'll, we'll talk about kind of the importance of the living roots um, throughout the year and protecting the soil, but you wanna make sure that the soil is able to trade its resources in between those microbes. So that's um, the sugars that the plants are able to 
literally like pump into the soil with its roots. And then also the ability of those microbes to, to, to trade off what, what they eat, but also what the, uh, what the plants need. And they have complex ways of communicating with each other on that. All right, so um, the important characteristics that you would wanna know about your soil um, are soil texture, drainage, holding water holding capacity, organic matter, pH, and the nutrients and salt content. And you can get all these by doing a soil test. So we're probably, I'm gonna probably say this a couple of times today. We can't know what's, what your soil needs um, without doing a soil test. There's no way to really predict. You can predict it, but you could never know for sure. So we recommend doing a soil test at least once every five years, just to get an idea of what you're working with. Um, and then you can help develop goals. Like if you have zero to 1% organic matter, then one of your goals might be adding compost every year to try to increase that organic matter. Um, oh, I wanted to say real quick, so just about a soil test. Um, if whenever you do take your soil sample, um, the next slide is a couple labs that you can send it to, but it's pretty, it's not very complex at all. You'll want to contact the lab to make sure you're filling out whatever form. If you're, if you have an agricultural, like a pasture, you would want to let them know versus if you have a garden and you're growing vegetables, because they're going to give you different recommendations, fertilizer recommendations based on what you're growing. So you want to make sure you're filling that out as accurate as possible. Um, and then once you pick a lab, try and stick with the, the same lab because they're going to do different methods. So, um, so the answer from one lab to another might be like comparing apples and bananas. They might not be comparable. Um, so anyway, when you go take your sample, you don't have to dig a super big hole like this. You just want to kind of take a clean shovel, a clean bucket, dig down the root depth. So like six to eight inches take um, a few samples, random samples here and there throughout your garden or whatever space you're testing and then mix it together in the bucket. And then from that mixture, you can get, usually it's just like a sandwich bag that they need um, that's for your actual sample. And then you can send that or drop it off at the lab. So it's pretty simple. And this is uh, some of the labs that I know of around here. Um, we have a handout in the back and for folks online, you can just do a quick screenshot of that. All right, Derek, you're up. Sure. So the, the second tip, once you know what's in your soil, what you have to work with, you can mulch or amend it to improve the qualities that you're going for. And I will add that um, Jennifer mentioned the uh, web soil survey. And that's a great place to start. Um, but with, with NRCS soil maps, they're produced through modeling. So you don't have to worry about someone coming onto your property and you know taking a core out of your lawn and sending it into a lab without you knowing or something sketchy like that. So they have computer modeling to tell people what they probably have to work with. But that'll give you kind of a starting point of what is likely going on underground but you can't know unless you test. So again, we're gonna try to drive home the point that you need to test your soil to fully understand what you're working with. So the two ways to increase organic matter, uh, which is again, tip number two, is to mulch. So you're applying uh, material on the surface of the soil or you can amend, which means that you're adding it and then you're incorporating it into the soil to get it closer to the root zone. And soil organic matter consists of multiple things. Um, so we have living organisms, dead organisms, plant matter, and other decomposing organic materials. So uh, it's interesting, most of the organic matter that we're talking about, it's microbes that have a very short lifespan. They can go through multiple generations in a season. So you wanna keep turning, again, that economy over so that you can build up the, you know, the dead microbes that are in your, your soil, which will eventually be broken down and can improve the soil health over time. The, the benefits of organic matter, uh, increased water and nutrient retention. It encourages beneficial soil microbes. And the more you encourage beneficial soil microbes, you're going to 
disincentivize potentially uh, hazardous or damaging um, soil microbes. So pathogens could be uh, bacteria, fungi, or even viruses that can infect your plants and cause issues. So the more you have a healthy, dynamic ecosystem underground with lots of soil organic matter, you're going to have more of those good bugs and less bad bugs. It also reduces soil compaction and improves water infiltration. So again, we want whatever falls on that property to be able to be taken up into the soil. You, you know, in a, in a place like Gilpin County or most of Colorado for that matter, you want whatever precipitation falls on your property to stay on your property. You want it to be stored in the soil. And one of the main ways that um, the soil organic matter promotes that is um, it's, it's literally organic glues that the soil microbes and the fungi produce. So one that we've only begun to understand in the last uh, 20, 30 years, and we understand more every year is um, lamellin. It's a, it's a protein that binds the soil together in these stable aggregates um, and allows the soil to resist compaction and, um, and again, improve the water infiltration because it preserves the pore space in between those soil aggregates. And we're going to be using, um, you know, the word soil amendment, but in a lot of cases, if you don't want to uh, till your soil uh, because you have perennials or something, you can mulch uh, on top. So a lot of like no-till market gardeners, they'll mulch with compost. When we're saying mulch, it doesn't have to just be wood chips or um, like plastic uh, weed berry or something like that. A lot of these amendments, as long as they're not going to blow away or an animal is going to try to eat them, um, you can mulch with them on top of the surface. So when you're adding amendments, uh, you want to improve that water retention, permeability, water infiltration, aeration, and structure. And all those terms are related to each other. You, you want to maintain the pore space and, if possible, increase the pore space in compacted soils. You want to increase organic matter to four or 5% over time. Uh, and some soils might already be close to that. However, there's a lot of soils that I've seen might only have one, 2% organic matter. Uh, and if that's the case, it would definitely benefit from amending it or mulching it to increase that organic matter over time. Um, and we say over time because if you add too much of one thing at one point, it can throw off that ecosystem, that economy, um, and it might, uh, you know, incentivize microbes that at smaller amounts are good, but in larger amounts are, are a bad thing. And then, you know, there's people that have asked me, so if four or 5% is good, do we want it to be, you know, eight or 10% organic matter? Um, and you can get up to that point. It, it takes, it takes some effort, um, but some gardens that, you know, constantly adding too much compost, they can get up to that, um, to that point. Um, and at that point, it can actually cause some issues with toxic toxicity with some nutrients that again, at lower levels are, are needed. They're necessary for plant growth, like phosphorus. Um, some soils that, uh, like in community gardens that keep adding compost year after year, you know, in a, in a place like Colorado, it's very unlikely to happen, but it's something to be aware of. Um, you can have plants that have uh, soils that have too much phosphorus and it can cause toxicity issues and issues with availability of other nutrients. I, I see leaves up there mm -hmm. um, being as we're Aspens are predominant. Is it okay to use aspen leaves? Or I yeah. read that those were bad. Was there a particular reason people said? No, just that in general they were bad. Okay. Um, so almost any like aspen, cottonwood, poplar, um, the leaves can take a while to break down. So it it depends on kind of what their concern was. With any amendment almost anything in moderation is okay. Uh, if there's, you know, persistent disease issues with the leaves, there are some things that um, can survive in compost unless it's 
really active compost that you're turning and getting hot multiple times that kills the pathogen. That might be some uh, issue or uh, some people they're, you know, they're kind of woody and it can take a while for those leaves to break down. Um, and then also if you have like green grass clippings or green leaves, that's going to have more nitrogen to carbon than something that's, you know, like dry grass and dry brown leaves. So that's, that might also be an issue. They were worrying about throwing that more to one side than the other. It's, it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. And then when you're adding soil amendments, it's again important to consider the pH of the soil, the texture, and the level of salts in the soil. And so we automatically, a lot of us, when we're grown, we hear salts and we think that it's a bad thing. You know, you have road salts, you have ice melt um, that's, you know, poisoning the soil, it's salting the earth. But a lot of conventional or synthetic fertilizers are salts. Um, like there are a lot of people that use Epsom salt, for example, which is magnesium sulfate. Um, again, it's important to test your soil so you know what you should be adding, because I've spoken with people that they've added Epsom salt to their garden every year, um, just because they heard that that's good for tomatoes um, and like blossom end rot. But blossom end rot is a calcium deficiency. And if you're adding too much magnesium sulfate, it can skew the ratio of magnesium to calcium, and it can actually make it worse. And then some people are like, oh, I'm not adding enough Epsom salt, so I need to add more. So salt is not a bad word. It's just something that we need to be aware of when we're adding things to our soil, because it can have long-term impacts on it. So amend according to soil characteristics. So we've, we've touched this already, sand, uh, silt, and loam, and clay. Um, the, I, I won't read it all off for you because it seems like you guys have a pretty good idea of what a poorly drained soil is versus uh, a well-drained soil and how you might need to amend that to improve it. But um, in both sandy soils and clay soils, the best way to improve the texture is to add organic matter. So if you're adding it to sand, it's increasing the water holding capacity and the porosity. And if you're doing that to clay, which already is able to hold a lot of water, you're increasing the porosity still and the ability of roots to penetrate through that and for gas exchange to happen within the roots. Roots can't grow anywhere unless there's pore space for oxygen and carbon dioxide and other gases to be exchanged. Um, so again, this is just kind of going over a few common soil amendments and their relative permeability and their ability to uh, increase the soil's water holding uh, capacity. So we have some of these that are organic. So peat, wood chips, spark, compost, manure are all organic. And then vermiculite and perlite are inorganic, so they're not alive, they're, they're mineral. Um, both of them are uh, volcanically derived um, and, and they're processed. So they're not in their natural form, they're mined and then processed to be used by, to be used by gardeners. So again, organic amendments, we're talking about, um, you know, not something that's like listed as organic on a label or something like that. Organic just means that it's carbon-based. So it used to be living or it even is still living in some cases. So uh, aged or composted manure, uh, sphagnum peat, wood chips, sawdust, grass clippings, straw, all add hay to that. Um, hay is an excellent mulch. Um, it has a higher nitrogen to uh, carbon ratio than straw. So if you want to increase the nitrogen, um, you can use hay instead of straw. Um, just have to be careful, like straw with potential weed seeds and things like that, that might be in that. Compost alfalfa pellets um, and also um, oil seed meals or pellets. So like soy or linseed, um, there's often mil uh, meal or pellets that are available from feed stores or large agricultural suppliers. Um, that can provide macro and micronutrients. 
uh, biochar, um, and then you want to incorporate that six to eight inches deep. Um, and why do you think we say six to eight inches deep? That's exactly, that's where the roots are. So do you have to do that? No, if you want to minimize your soil disturbance, if you've been working on that for a while, um, then you can mulch with it. Um, if you do mulch with multiple types, um, it's good to kind of incorporate those on the surface just very shallowly. Um, so they're in closer contact with the soil surface. So it, you want that interface to be touching um, so that those microbes can uh, can break that down. If there's if there's not enough contact, then it'll decompose very slowly and you'll still get an improvement. Um, it'll just be over a longer period of time. I have a question. Yeah. I've, I've seen a couple of things where they talked about, I used to go in and, and dig my gardens every mm -hmm. year. And I came across some information that indicated that there are a whole lot of systems under there that are connected. And if you're doing that, you're breaking those down. Mm -hmm. Do we want to be digging our gardens every year or? I, I let people make their own decision with that because depending upon how they grow, that can impact what they do. Um, personally, I do not. And I, I suggest to people that they don't till. So are you familiar with like broad forking? Have you heard of that before? So it's, it's basically a large fork. Um, it's kind of like a pitchfork with reinforced tines that you stick in the soil and then you rock it back and forth. And so that can help you incorporate some of those amendments or even the mulch and help prepare the seedbed if you're gonna be, excuse me, seeding or uh, transplanting into that, into that bed, but you're not, um, you're not tilling it. Because tilling it, again, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later, the, the downsides of tillage, but that tillage can create a hard pan, um, it is breaking up the soil aggregates. It's people like it because they think it fluffs up the soil and it does at first, but it does at the cost of uh, consuming carbon, which is the power source of the soil. Um, and then, you know, by the end of the season, it's compacted again. So um, you are breaking up those networks, those, so it's the, the mycorrhizal uh, fungi, beneficial fungi, mycelium, hyphae, they're all these words to describe those networks, kind of the highways underground. Um, and those, those highways are always changing. Um, so there's roads that are closing and new roads that are opening all the time. Um, but if, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, and in, in some cases, you know, I've, I've had issues with like pocket gophers or bulls that people um, purposefully try to till it up to um, discourage the bulls going into there. Um, so it, again, it depends on kind of the context, but in most cases, it's better not to till if if you if you can grow without doing that. Yeah, I was really surprised when I first came across that, and it makes a whole lot of sense once you start to understand how much down there. Right, right. So. And, and there's a, a lot of people that still have it in their mind that when they're tilling, you know, they're adding air to the soil and it's nice and black, it looks good. But um, over the long term, you're, you're, you're consuming the soil, you're draining the battery, you're, you know, there's a recession in the soil economy. So you want to try to stay away from that. A little bit is okay. And even um, like I use a really kind of cheapo electric uh, rototiller um, that I got from, you know, Walmart or something. And it can't go down more than two inches into the soil, especially like in Colorado, if you're hitting clay or rocks. But I like it because it, it kind of shreds the material on the top. Um, and it can, again, create a, more of an interface in between the soil and the, the litter the organic matter on top so it can decompose and it makes it easier to, to seed into. So uh, a lot of beneficial organic amendments are, are wood products and we have, you know, we have a lot of that available to us here in Colorado. Wood chips and bark to aerate clay soils, 
um, we have to be careful with wood ash because that will uh, increase the soil pH. Uh, it does contain a lot of, um, most of what is in wood ash is, is mineral. So it's the, the compounds in the wood that don't volatilize. They're not burnt off. It doesn't come off in steam. It's what's left that won't go up you know, in the smoke. It doesn't have a gaseous form. So it can add some uh, micronutrients to the soil. So a little bit of wood ash in moderation and throughout time isn't a bad thing. The soil can kind of adapt to it. But if you're all work, already working with high pH soils, you just don't, don't bother with it because um, it, it can cause issues with nutrient availability. Uh, and uh, wood ash, sawdust, wood chips, biochar, they do tie up nitrogen uh, temporarily. So you might hear, you know, gardeners talk about nitrogen lock or, oh, I don't want to add wood chips to my garden because then there won't be any nitrogen. Well, it's, it's temporary. So the soil microbes are using the nitrogen to decompose that wood. They need that nitrogen um, to form the molecules for them to function while they're eating, eating that away. So once those microbes die, then that nitrogen is available again. Something else might eat that microbe, but um, in the long term, you're not changing the amount of nitrogen in the soil. If anything, by adding organic matter, you're increasing the soil's ability to store nitrogen and make soil or uh, nitrogen available to plants when they need it over the long term. And so biochar is something that a lot of people aren't familiar with. They might've heard about it. Has, is anyone in the room familiar with biochar at all? No? So um, you can kind of see in, in this diagram that sand, silt, and clay that Jennifer was talking about before the relative sizes of those soil particles. Biochar is, uh, it, it provides the surface area of, where did I put that? Is the jar, yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, sure. So um, the, the bag is fertilizer that has, that's pelletized and has biochar as a main component. And then in the mason jar, that is pure biochar that was produced in Colorado. But the benefit of biochar is that it provides the surface area of clay. So it's bonding sites for nutrients, um, which are then available to plants but it, it maintains the porosity like a sand might. So you're getting the benefits of adding organic matter um, with, with some uh, benefits, which we'll, which we'll go over as well. So the idea of biochar or just charcoal in soils isn't new. So um, in the Amazon, there, there are these anthropogenic soils. So man-made soils, uh, in some cases, we think was made intentionally. In other cases, it was uh, literally just a, a landfill. So a pre-Columbian, uh, you know, landfill. So there are these pieces of pottery, of charcoal from fires, of uh, bones, of uh, spoiled produce or grain, and then they get deposited in an area. And then over time, people realize that these soils are very productive. So in, in the tropics, most of the nutrients and most of the stored energy is above ground. So you because it's so hot and humid, everything breaks down very quickly. And so there's this um, competition to make use of it as quickly as possible. But in more temperate climates like Colorado, um, that process takes much, much longer. So we have more of that storage below ground. So they realized that these, these really dark, rich soils, and terra preta means dark soil in Portuguese, um, it was able to produce a lot more. So in that, in that one slide, um, this is Kelpie Wilson. She's a biochar a practitioner as well known um, in the biochar space. This is a native uh, soil in Brazil, and you can see kind of how the corn is doing. It, it looks chlorotic, it's yellowing, a little stunted. It's only up to the guy's chest. Whereas this one, this much darker charcoal soil, 
uh, is much more productive. And not only that, the, the plants look much healthier. So it'd be more resilient to drought, more resilient to pests and diseases. Yes. So can we say the charcoal pieces from our wood stoves and compost there? Yes, yes. Again, everything in moderation. Biochar, um, because you're going to have some wood ash in there and it will increase the pH, but not as much as pure, uh, pure wood ash. So, so biochar, when I say biochar, I mean charcoal, but it, it differs from like cooking charcoal because all of the volatile compounds have been driven off. So they've been, it's been cooked at high temperature, low oxygen. So everything that will burn off as a gas does, except for the carbon. So you're left with this, this relic structure. So if we go back to this slide, this is a piece of wood biochar that has the pore space from the vessels of the tree's tissue. And so you can make biochar out of grasses, you can make it out of wood, but wood is often the most beneficial because it maintains those macro and micro pores. And biochar acts as a, as a micro condo. So it provides all the utilities a microbe needs um, once it reaches equilibrium with the soil or the compost. So once those bonding sites, those chemical bonding sites on those carbon have reached a level where they're unbalanced. Um, microbes can move in and they can live there as happily as they would anywhere else in the soil. So they're, they're lazy. They like to, they, you know, they eat where they sleep. They're kind of slobs. Um, but it provides uh, food and water and even electric. We're learning more about the role of biochar in the electron electric conductivity of the soil. So that's what that EC is. And when we're, talk when we're talking about EC, usually we're worried about salts. So if the soil has high EC, we're worried about how much salt it has. But with biochar, it, it can be a battery in the soil. So it can provide ele electron exchange which is important for some processes in that soil economy um, without raising uh, the level of salts in the soil. And then it increases the, the water availability also. So whereas if you were to add salts, um, it would increase that ability of the soil to exchange electrons, but you can cause issues with the water balance in the soil. Uh, another common organic amendment is peat, so sphagnum peat moss, uh, generally acidic, which again, depending upon your soil, could be a good thing or a bad thing. In a lot of parts of Colorado, it's a good thing. It can increase soil water holding uh, over time, but it's hydrophobic if it dries out. So you might, you know, have potted something up with a mix that has a lot of peat moss in it, and then you try to water it, and then it just pools on the top because it repels water if it dries out. So um, it's good as a component of a soilless growing media or as an amendment, but not when it's there in huge amounts if you're trying to grow a plant through its whole life cycle. And then you might see something called Colorado mountain peat. Thankfully, this isn't as common anymore because people realize how, uh, how damaging it can be, but Colorado mountain peat isn't peat moss. So, it's, uh, it's uh, grass species that uh, take a very long time to develop. Um, and then it's basically topsoil that's harvested in Colorado. So if you ever see Colorado mountain peat, uh, definitely don't buy it. Usually it would come in bulk. You wouldn't buy it like in a bag from like a hardware store or Home Depot or something like that. Where, where would you buy that stuff? Um, so that actually I, I made. So I had an uh, organic uh, fertilizer business in North Dakota. Um, and then when I moved back to Colorado, I dissolved the business. So that, that exact product you can't buy anymore. Um, but the ingredients in it, you can, you can buy yourself and, um, you know, and incorporate as just a soil amendment. 
So the, the product um, does all the hard work of measuring it out for you and everything, and then provides it to you in a package, but the ingredients you can buy and, and still amend your soil with us. So if you have heat that's dried out, uh, can it be revitalized through gradual watering or is there a point of no return? Oh, no, no, um, not at all. So in Colorado, it can be difficult because of the relative humidity is really low. So it likes to dry out. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Like um, if I'm potting something up and I have a bag of like potting mix from the store, often I'll put a slit in the top and I'll just run my hose in it until, you know, it can't hold any more water um, because they, they try to dry it out to a point where it's not dusty, but they don't want to have a, a super heavy bag for people to, to tote around. So yeah, you can, you can put it in a tote and add water. You just have to really mix it in really well because it, um, you know, it likes to flow. So yeah, definitely it's not, if, if you have peat moss that dries out, it's not like it's ruined or anything. You just need to rehydrate it, um, which might take uh, a few days. Um, and so that's something with biochar too, because it has that porosity and it can hold many times its weight in water. It can be beneficial to charge it with water and nutrients before you add it. The soil will eventually balance itself out, but if you do that before you add it to the soil, um, it can kind of increase your return. Um, and then another common organic amendment, manure and compost. And then also composted manure. So manure, you know, because it comes from an animal, uh, it may have pathogens such as E. coli, which again, you know, we're, we come into contact with E. coli every day. Um, it's just when it becomes present in too high amounts and then, you know, like we ingest it. So if we apply it to some leafy greens and then harvest it and don't properly wash it right away, then we can take in too much of that and, uh, and make ourselves sick. And so with like aged manure, it's best to, uh, to compost it, to actively compost it through hot composting or vermicomposting. Um, but you can just age it uh, as long as it's not a huge component of the soil. Um, so you want to let it sit and kind of break down um, the salts um, and other potential uh, hazards to kind of mellow out. <clears throat> and then composted manure, uh, always preferable. Yeah. Are you talking about that that we're gathering ourselves from animals or that we're buying? So both. Okay, and, and I guess when I say buying, I'm not talking about what you can buy at Home Depot in the back. Right. So, um, and and the reality is that most people don't have access to animals or the time or, you know, the, the physical ability to turn manure to compost it. So um, getting bad compost at the, um, you know, big box store, there's nothing wrong with that. You just have to be careful um, because often it comes from like dairies or confined animal feeding operations where um, it's not properly composted. So it might say, composted manure, but it's it hasn't gone through that complete process. So if you open up a bag of manure compost and it still smells like manure, it doesn't smell like soil, um, or or if it's, yeah, if it smells kind of like stinky, you know, if it kind of burns your nose, or if you add water to it, if you add it to your garden or something and add water and it heats up too much, that tells you that it hasn't been properly composted. Um, and that's not always a bad thing. Uh, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't buy it. It's just something to be aware of. Uh, and in some cases, uh, you know, I'll buy the cheapo manure, um, you know, I'll test it for the, the, I'll check the EC with the EC reader uh, for salts, and then I'll, I'll just add it to other compost that I have. Um, so there's lots of things that you, you know, you're not supposed to compost, but as long as it's a small component, it's not gonna cause a, a big issue in your garden. Um, the main things to be, to steer away from is things like heavy metals um, or things that would drastically change the soil pH in the direction that you don't wanna go. Because once you add that, you can't really take it back out of the soil. 
And is there a magic number for what our pH should be? Uh, for be neutral. Yes. Yeah. I, and for most most plants, around seven is neutral, and that's ideal. Um, really, it's it's more towards like six point five, maybe six, kind of depending upon what you're growing. Um, but for for most plants, if you can get around that seven mark, you're you're golden. And that's when most of the important um, nutrients are are available for plants to take up. They're not locked out, and that's where most soil microbes have developed, and and they're happy with that range. So really, you want it to be above 5.5, and you want it to be below 8.5, definitely. Um, it's, it's more difficult working with an alkaline soil, with a high pH soil, than an acidic soil, in my experience. So it's easier to bring up that soil pH in an acidic soil than bring down uh, the pH of an alkaline soil. Because one thing to keep in mind with soil pH is that it's logarithmic. So if you have six to seven, that's a factor of 10. If you have six to eight, that's a hundred. So it's, it's logarithmic, it's not a straight line. So the more you have to change the soil pH, it's not just adding double the amount, you're adding 10 times or more. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, so yeah, and there's depending upon what manure you have to work with, whether it's horse, cow, sheep, alpaca, guinea pig, whatever the case may be, there's different things that you might want to do to compost it, or you might not even need to compost it, depending upon the animal. Um, so you would have to do more research into into what what you have to work with and what you want to do with it. And one follow up question: In the mountains, <clears throat> with the amount of pine needles that that we get up our trees that fall into our gardens. I'm assuming they're acidic, is that right? They are. So when they're green, they're acidic. Once they've dried out, they're still a little acidic, but not very acidic. So it's kind of an old wives' tale that if you have too many pine needles, it's going to acidify your soil because pine trees like a little acidity. So they like living in acidic soil. So it's really, the trees are there because it's naturally acidic and not that they caused it. Um, and in a lot of cases, they might look at, you know, if you look at a forest floor that has heavy pine needles, oh, nothing is coming through that, through those pine needles because it's too acidic. But in most cases, it's just because it's too thick of a mulch. Um, the mature trees above are consuming all the water that that site gets. Um, the pine needles decompose relatively slowly. They're really resilient to decomposition. And then some evergreens produce compounds that are called allelopathic, which uh, you don't need to remember that word, but it means that plants are kind of in an arms race with their neighbor. So they're releasing compounds, even if it's through their leaf litter, that's trying to um, outcompete other plants. So that's that's often the case. So you're you're talking about multiple factors. And the acidity in, in most cases isn't a problem. And in some cases, it's actually a good thing. So in a lot of soils that might be alkaline, high pH that you're planting a pine tree in, um, any acidity that you can naturally add to that soil would, would probably be beneficial. But that's a, a very good question, and it's a very common question. What about coffee ground? Mm -hmm. So that's another um, con common misconception because a coffee is acidic, but the spent coffee grounds, again, are mildly acidic, but they're not going to throw everything off, especially if you have it in moderation because the spent coffee grounds, it's high carbon. Um, there's There's natural oils in it and compounds that can that can be beneficial for soil. So co coffee grounds are, are a great uh, amendment or addition to compost. Again, if you have like, so if you somehow get your hands on like a dump truck worth of coffee grounds, then that might be an issue. But um, everything in moderation. So again, uh, some precautions with manure. 
it's a great tool um, to use if you use it correctly. So you want to avoid um, potential human pathogens or even uh, pathogens that might be spread to other animals, whether you're your own pets or livestock or wildlife, can be high in salts. Um, so the the electrolytes, the salts, the minerals that we take in or animals take in are then excreted through manure and urine. And so those are concentrated in that waste. So that's something to be uh, aware of when you're adding that. And then also, uh, depending upon the animal, some uh, animal digestive systems can kill seeds, others don't. So like horse manure can um, spread a lot of seeds just because they don't get broken down in the digestive tract. If you were using a manure, which one would you choose? Um, whatever's closest. Yeah. <laughs> um, They're all in the big box door. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Um, so I, I generally like sheep, like a sheep and peat is a good mix. Um, if you can get alpaca. So some communities, if you're close to an alpaca farm or something like that, or a llama, um, that can be excellent. You don't really need to worry about composting it. Um, it. It can be incorporated at relatively high rates. But um, you know the larger animals like horses, cows, um, they're great because the animals produce a lot of it. Um, and if you're close to an operation like that, you know make make use of it. You just have to make sure that you don't over apply it. Um, so any any questions about organic amendments before we move on? So again, when I say organic, I just mean that it was alive or previously living. Okay, um, so I'll kind of go into inorganic inorganic amendments. So again, just means it wasn't alive. It's not not alive. So vermiculite, perlite, gravel, and sand. So with, with sand, we, we talked about the potential hazards of adding too much sand to clay. Um, and that's because it just makes a brick. So that chart that Jennifer showed where it was the, the clay, silt, and sand, you notice that you know at <clears throat> relatively low percentage of clay, clay dominates. So you would have to add you know, double, triple, quadruple the amount of clay you have in the soil after you replace that with sand to really change the texture. <clears throat> but um, if you want to increase it, um, or if you want to add it, it's it's it can be beneficial, especially if you add the right kind of sand. So you don't want to add like clay sand. If you have like a sandbox that you bought some bags of clay sand in, and you're like, oh, I'll just add this to my soil. So that it's like um, like little marbles. It's, it's very fine. It can actually make things worse in your soil. What you want is a lot of fractured faces. You want it to be really chunky and sharp. So you can use things like green sand, which is uh, sometimes sold as a fertilizer, um, and then uh, foundry sand. So there's even some places, if, if there's a foundry, make sure that they're not working with like lead or something that might impact the sand, but uh, foundry sand has to be replaced. It is recyclable, but they can only add so much um, back into the process. So if there's a foundry nearby, you can visit with them about um, potentially accessing some of that. Um, so in general, uh, vermiculite for sandy soils, perlite for clay soils, but the the whole idea is to increase porosity. So you wanna make the soil softer, fluffier, more space for water and gases to be exchanged in the soil column. So, and I'll hand it back to Jennifer. All right, thank you. Okay, so let's just talk quickly about compost. Uh, since compost seem, I don't know, to me, it seems like the easiest answer to add organic matter to your soil because we have all these ingredients um, on our day-to-day -day life that we can save and, and make our own compost. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about it. We could probably have a whole class about making compost, but basically you need five ingredients. It's just as much an art as it is a science. Carbon and nitrogen are your main two ingredients. Carbons are the browns, nitrogen are the greens um, or, or manure, like the fresh ingredients. Um, so getting the right kind of ratio 
as well as aeration, uh, time, and water. Um, so you tend to need to water your compost maybe more than you might think, especially since it's so dry out here, if you're doing it outside, especially. Um, and then the amount of time that your compost takes, it really just depends on how you're doing it. If you're adding like this perfect amount of carbon nitrogen ratio and you're making your compost pile all at once, and then you're watering it and turning it every day, it will turn into compost very quickly. Versus if you do it like we do it at the community garden where we just like randomly throw stuff in there, um, nothing's really chopped up. Occasionally we water it. So in that case, we tend to get like a few inches of compost from the bottom every year, but otherwise it doesn't, it doesn't really turn into compost very quickly and that's okay. So it really just depends on what you want. Just things to keep in mind, avoid meats, oils, any diseased plants, and if you can, keep the weed seeds out of the compost. Um, so these are just some ideas on how you could compost. You could use worms. That picture in the top is a worm tower. We have one of those at our CSU Extension office in the lobby. If you wanna come talk to me about worm composting, I love my worms and I'll, I'll talk to you about how to do that, how to compost with worms. Um, you can see these pictures. You could dig a hole and, and throw compost in a hole and cover it up. Um, the community garden looks similar to the one on the right where we just have some pallets to hold a space for the stuff that we throw in the compost. Um, Mike is here today. Do you want to come up here and talk sure. about what you do for your, you do a kind of a fun, yeah. uh, a fun few techniques for composting? Hi, I'm Mike Plant. I'm one of the master gardeners. And, uh, what I found, of course, up here we got word about bears showing up. So, uh, so rather than making a compost pile, what I do is I've just got a small trash can with a lid on it, and so and I use a I've got one of those uh, shredder chippers, uh, a cheap one from Har uh, from Harbor Freight. So all my my composting stuff I throw through there, you know, grind it up, and then put it in that that uh, small trash can, and then. You want to put a layer, you know, put a layer of compost in there and put a layer of dirt um, or at least something brown material. You know, the pine needles will work too for that or wood chips. I use both. I throw those through the chipper as well, kind of shred them up. And then, you know, add add water to it occasionally. You don't want to, like you said, you don't want to, you know, mud, but you do want to add, add water to it. And I just kind of add that as it dries out. I'll throw some more water in. And then in the fall, I'll just take and I'll dump that thing out. Uh, usually by the time it's got cold and I figure the bears are gone, uh, it's usually by that time it's broke down. And I, I'll tell you what, it really stinks by the time you dump it out too, because it really broke down a lot. Um, and then the other thing I do is, you know, occasionally I'll, you know, like when it rains hard and the worms come out, I'll pick up worms and throw them in there too. And of course I throw them in the garden. And then uh, during the winter time, what I do is, is I just take and shred like, you know, eggshells and, banana peels and anything else that's that green I shred and then I just usually just put that out on the garden and then like you talked about and then I'll and then springtime I'll take you know take a pitchfork and I won't dig it up a lot I just take you know, the other surface and break it up and then I might throw some more dirt on top of it just to kind of you know cover it up again uh, and that works pretty good uh, I've had real good success with doing that and then the other manure source I was going to mention is if you're like me, you got moose wandering through, <laughs> you know, and uh, that's that's manure, you know. They can, you know, especially after it's broke down over the winter time, they can mm -hmm. put that and put it in the compost or put it on top of the garden and you know mix it in. That's usually pretty fine stuff that breaks up real well. Uh, the other source too that you know I probably like like me, you probably have burned wood up here. And you know, my wood pile had been there. My house was built in 81 and my wood pile had been there, you know, probably since that time. So when I was raking away all the stuff that was on top, uh, you get down to the bottom, it's really nice, fine black dirt, you know. And that's another thing I use in the mix in as compost too. And again, it's already broke down a lot. I'm sure there's lots of, I haven't checked it, but I'm sure there's lots of organisms in that stuff too. So uh, that's another good good thing. Of the fact, when I started my raised beds, that's what I put down first. Was that stuff too? I figured that was there. That was really good soil. So, anyways, that's that's what I do. Thank you. I, I, I was kind of thinking along the same lines, but only a mini version. Um, in terms of you had mentioned the chipper. I mean, I don't have access yeah. to that kind of thing. 
So in my mind, I've been thinking, well, I've got this old blender. Yeah. And if I can just blend up stuff and move it yeah. into dirt, I mean, um, does that help break it down quicker? I would think it, so. It's smaller it parts. makes it finer, yeah. Yeah, um, so it's going to, you know, like, like you were talking earlier with, with the wood chips and that, it takes a lot of time for those to break down and it uses more nitrogen. So to my way of thinking, the smaller I got it, the quicker, you know, it Yeah, that's kind down. of where I was, what I was thinking. Yeah. And, and you could just... And you have to compost that, or can you put that directly in your garden? Both. You know, you can compost it or put it in the garden either way. Um, I compost it because I've got everything else. You know, yeah, it sounds in like there. you got a production yeah. going. Yeah, and and what I did too when my original compost pile, I got some wood chips over here um, at the you know the uh, uh, the big wood chip pile. Yeah. But the problem with that stuff, if you ever look at it, a lot of times it's pretty big. Um, and so I, that's why I ran it through the small, the smaller chipper to, to get it just a better, you know, better size, break it down some more. Yeah. yeah. You know, the problems with the bears getting into the trash can. They've never attacked the trash can mm -hmm. itself. And it's just, it's just one of those small ones with a plastic lid that yeah. snaps onto the top. Yeah. And then I've also, when I fill that up, I use just one of those five gallon buckets with the lid on it. And just to be sure, I'll throw you know I'll throw something on top for weight, but they've never attacked it, and it sits right by, it sits out in the open behind my garage. And one of the things too that helps if you got a sunny spot is what the heat from the sun if that heat set up that helps break it down quicker too. You know, so although we don't you know we don't get a lot of you know, radiant heat up here, but you will get soaked with the sun, yeah. And of course, the stuff breaking down will heat up too. When I lived in Grand Junction, I of course there you get up to 100 degrees in the summer. That when I did that over there, it turned into water. That's <laughs> how I got so. Uh, and you could pour it on the garden. So, but here, yeah, and it, it turned into it could be kind of slushy stuff, but it uh, like I say, kind of stinky, but it works really well. And then throw it on the garden and just you know, chop it up real well. So, yeah. Thanks, Mike. Sure. Does anyone else want to share their composting stories? I guess I would just say that I, uh, when I came up here many years ago, I bought a couple of composting bins that are on a metal frame that have aeration holes inside of it and that you can just, you know, spin and tip. Mm -hmm. Those have been worked really well and uh, have been pretty bear proof that the lids, I think I got it from online from Gardener Supply. And the lids were really safe. The bears have tried it. I've got bear claw marks on the ground. But, uh, and one time, one really persistent one knocked it down and rolled it around a little bit. But yeah, it. It never got into it. And the aeration, I mean, it just it doesn't get sticky when, when the air or slowly when you cut the air. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I mean, there's just so many ideas for composting. Um, we could talk all day about it. Real quick, I just wanted to mention, um, you could use, if you really want to get into it, you can use a compost thermometer. I bought this on Amazon for like 20 bucks or something. Um, this is just a picture of how I used it. Um, so this is a big, uh, at my friend's place, she has pretty much four, horse and sheep. I think this probably is with the bedding. So manure and bedding actually makes really good compost. So they make big piles and turn them uh, with machines. So you can see when we dug into this compost, it's really hot and heating up inside, steaming. We put the thermometer in there, it was 120 degrees. So that's that. this is the kind of thing that you want if you want, like that's why you're turning it and watering it and trying to get the right carbon nitrogen ratio because then the bugs are gonna be really happy and they're gonna heat up the soil in the process and break everything down. So if you're trying to kill weed seeds, you want to make sure you're heating it up to 130 degrees for at least eight hours. Um, otherwise, you don't want to have it super hot, like 150 or more will kill the good bacteria that you want to be living in this system. I think you probably have to try pretty hard, though, to heat it up that hot. <laughs> um, I think we already kind of talked about some of these. Um, so maybe I'll just leave this up here. I don't know if anyone wants a break. We've been going for a bit now. We still have a lot of slides left. <laughs> Do you guys want to take a break? I'm seeing some no's. Yes, anyone want to break? No? You want to keep 
slugging through. All right. Well, I don't know if there's any comments online, but you guys can probably do, do they want to break or do they have questions? If they don't want to break, because there were some questions. Oh, okay. I didn't want to interrupt each other. Um, one of the comments was, I've heard alpacas and llamas have two stomachs and don't need a long compass. There you speak to that? Yeah, well, the, yeah, so they're already broken down quite a bit. And yeah, Derek kind of mentioned that already. So that's why he prefers them for his compost because it's already broken down. Yes. And then what about expanded shale and clay soil? Uh, expanded shale? Uh, yeah. Expanded shale and clay soil? Um, so I don't know if they're if they're referring to like vermiculite or in in some cases they're they're at additives that are um, common in the oil and gas industry as a part of fracking fluid that you can get for relatively cheap. So I don't know if they're talking about something like that um, or like uh, leonardite. It's a, a form of uh, of shale. It's it's coal basically. It's low grade lignite coal which can be used as, uh, I guess you could consider it in between organic and inorganic because it's, it used to be organic, you know, it was uh, organic matter that's decomposed over time, not quite whole. Um, so that can be a uh, very beneficial uh, soil amendment as well, as well at, at relatively small grades. Sorry. And then the, the follow-up that you can buy back in the skin gel at Hollywood environments. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I personally I've never used it. I don't have any familiarity with sure. it. But if they if they've tried it, then yeah, again, at almost anything in, in moderation, as long as you're not adding something, you know, objectively bad to the soil, so like heavy metal content. All right. Do you want to jump in with EC and pH? Sure. Yeah, and for, for those of you in the room, if, if you feel like you need to stand up or stretch or anything, feel free. You won't hurt my feelings. Um, so tip three, pay attention to EC, the electrical conductivity, and pH. And pH, uh, just it's basically, you can think of it as the power of hydrogen. So it's the activity of hydrogen ions in the soil. Um, and both of them are something that you need to be aware of, both when you have a soil test uh, done and then um, whatever crops you want to grow, you know, what pH or EC levels those crops prefer. Uh, and then also whatever you might be adding to the soil. So whether you're mulching or amending, um, you want to know how that might impact both of those levels in the soil. Um, and in particular, <clears throat> with the EC, um, you know, again, we're kind of talking about salts. Um, most of the time when we're talking about EC, it can change the osmotic pressure in the soil. So the plants use pressure. So they're, they're taking up water and they're taking up nutrients and they're evaporating, they're transpirating that water through their leaves and other green tissues. Uh, and then that creates that pressure. But there's also the osmotic pressure in the root zone where the root meets often beneficial fungi and where it meets the soil itself. Um, and where that meeting happens is kind of a gray area. But when we're talking about salts and EC, if you have too much salt, even if there's water in the soil, the plant has to work harder to pull that into its cells. So um, yeah, there's more I could say about like chemically and physically what's going on, but that's what you need to keep in mind. If you have too high of EC, too high of salts, the plants aren't able to use the water that's in the soil. And so that's something similar with the pH. And I'll talk about pH in a second. So here we're talking about the EC of various manure samples in, in Colorado. So, and, and then you can see many vegetable crops <clears throat> have a range of salt tolerance. There's some that are very salt sensitive <clears throat> and some that are very salt tolerant. So again, you wanna know what you're working with, what your crop 
uh, what range it's happiest in, uh, and then how you might change that, good, bad, or otherwise. And then, um, you know, these are high. You know, we're looking 1.5 to 4, and we're talking about, you know, 20s and 30s. But if you have that in uh, a smaller percentage, it, it can still be beneficial. You're not going to, you know, poison your soil by adding manure to it in, uh, in moderate amounts. So just like having too high salts in the soil, if the pH is too, too acidic, low pH, or too basic, too alkaline, too high pH, it can cause issues with the plant's ability to take up and use what's in the soil. So part of this is because of the interactions of the soil microbes and their populations in the soil at different pH levels. And also it's chemically, some compounds are gonna bind up and make them inaccessible if the pH is too much to one side or the other. So again, we're looking at really kind of pH six to seven is our sweet spot. You know, if you can grow in pH eight, um, but the plants might not thrive as they would otherwise. But you have to do that kind of calculus of whether it's worth trying to amend the soil to change the pH because you have that logarithmic scale. And then also um, in a lot of Colorado soils that are alkaline, there's lots of free calcium. So if you have like uh, even like table vinegar, like distilled vinegar, if you have some soil and you drop it on there and it fizzes, you know that there's a lot of free calcium and it's going to take a lot of effort to change the pH of that soil. So it's better to do things that are in your, in your control, like reduce other stresses, make sure that you water evenly and sufficiently throughout the root zone, uh, and then add organic matter and make sure that other potential uh, nutrients aren't deficient. Because even if you have a lot of phosphorus or, or iron, for example, in the soil, if the pH is skewed, it won't be available to the plant. So if you have like maple, a lot of people, they plant maple, especially in the front range and they get really chlorotic, they turn yellow. Um, and I've had some people say like, oh, I really like that like lime green maple tree. That's bad, okay? You might think it looks good at times of the season, but it's stressing the tree. And ultimately that tree in, in a lot of cases will die prematurely. Um, so even if you're adding like chelated iron to it to try to um, mitigate the chlorosis, if, if you're doing a root drench or something, it's probably not gonna help the tree much if you can't address that pH issue. Um, yeah, I'll turn it back to Jennifer to, to talk about um, kind of when in the season to apply fertilizer. All right. We got to talk faster, Derek. We do, yeah. <laughs> We're only on tip four. Okay. Um, fertilizing at the right time uh, and the right amount is important because if you have too much nitrogen or too much phosphorus, it can pollute our environment and can also hurt our plants. Um, this is just a sample showing, um, I think it's like a corn crop. Um, if my soil recommendation says I need a certain amount of nitrogen for the whole growing season for from planting to harvest and I put it down all at once, you can see on the picture on the right, all of that area that's kind of um, darker colored is nutrients lost, not used, but lost versus if you're if you do a few nitrogen applications per during the growing season, um, more of that nutrient will be used. Um, real quickly, we'll just look at the corn here on this picture. Instead of talking about the whole farm, we'll just talk about the corn pathways of nutrient loss. Um, so we're adding nutrients to our corn and you can see the nutrients. Some of the nutrients are being used by the crop, which is ideal. That's what we want. But also phosphorus and potassium tend to, tend to bind to soil particles. So they can run off with soil erosion, water moving the soil off the site. So that's how a potential pathway of loss. Um, nitrogen tends to bind to soil molecules and move wherever the, the water moves. So you can see potential leaching 
where um, the nitrogen is moving down into the water table and then we're potentially uh, drinking that water from our wells. So that can cause contamination there. We don't want high nitrates in our water. It can cause thyroid issues, can cause death in babies, um, just other, you know, other complications. And then of course, volatilization where the um, nutrients are turning into vapor and basically just evaporating or you know, getting, getting mixed with, into the atmosphere and lost that way. So those are just ways that our nutrients are being lost. So we don't want to over fertilize and we want to make sure we're fertilizing at a point where our plants can use the, the nutrients that we're adding. Uh, just real quickly, again, you've heard about like the fish kills and all the algae blooms, like especially in the Great Lakes, lakes but it happens here too in Colorado. And that's because there's excess uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, much, much from home gardeners and agriculture. Moving into the water, it causes algae to bloom and then die off quickly after the nutrients are used. And then as that algae is breaking that down in the water, it takes the oxygen away from the fish and causes fish kills. So it's like this nasty cycle that, so we really just, a, another way to reiterate why we don't want to over fertilize. Um, uh, so Again, just take a soil test before you just throw nutrients down. And the more organic matter you have, the less nutrients you'll probably need to add. So we're gonna talk quickly about our macro and micronutrients. So N, P, and K are the biggest nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. There's what, they're what you see on the labels, like 10, 10, 10 on this picture. Um, so nitrogen we need for leaf growth, phosphorus we need for flowers, fruits, roots production, and then potassium for durability just in general. Um, hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon come from water and air. We don't need to add those. And then the other macronutrients, which just means that the plants need more of it than micronutrients. Um, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur are important for, you know, the calcium is cell wall production and membranes. Photosynthesis, magnesium plays a big part in that, and protein synthesis for phosphorus, or sorry, for sulfur. Our micronutrients are needed in much smaller amount, amounts, and generally our soils have plenty of micro, micronutrients available, but again, the only way you know for sure is to test your soil. Um, so Derek kind of already talked about this with amendments, the difference between synthetic and organic fertilizers. Synthetics are materials transformed into a, a, um, a, a plant available form through some sort of industrial process, whereas organic fertilizers are just living things. And they're often, get my next slide here. So organic fertilizers, you can see they're often not necessarily in a form that the plants can take up right away. So the organic fertilizers, you want to keep that in mind. If you want uh, an immediate use of a nitrogen source, then you might want to use a synthetic fertilizer. If you want like a slow release over time, you can use organic fertilizers. So organics, they need kind of plants to uh, break them down and, and um, put them in a point in a, at a place that the plant roots can take up. So what's in a bag of fertilizer? Usually you see the N, P, and K at the top. So that's the percent of, of each in the fertilizer. Um, you'll see the content, where it comes from, and any sources. So it's really important to read the fertilizer bag to understand what you're purchasing. Um, and some often they do have recommendations on how much to use. And I would guess that their recommendations are on the high end. <laughs> so again, consider the amount of organic matter you have. Um, and also if you have a soil test, that'll make it easier for you to figure out how much to add. If I had a soil test that told me I needed 0.3 pounds of nitrogen per hundred square feet, and I bought this bag of blood meal that has 12% nitrogen, all I have to do is take the amount recommended, which is the 0.3, and then divide that by 0.12, which is the 12% in the bag that I have. And that'll give me the amount I need to apply for hundred square feet. So the math is pretty easy to do. You, you look confused. No, I wouldn't <laughs> take a picture of it on oh. my phone. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> I can send you guys these slides too. And and online there are excellent resources that include things like that. Like yeah. so in the in the master gardener program, there's excellent garden notes that can provide guides on um on how to calculate your nutrient requirements. And again, like Jennifer said, that where where she's getting that end needed is from that soil test. So often if you're it'll have a list of crops and how much nitrogen you might need to add based on what's in the soil test. And when you keep referring to you're talking about that soil test that you talked about in the very first couple of slides. Yeah. Tip yeah. number one you said. send your <laughs> soil to the test to a soil testing lab to get your uh, recommended recommendations. I think we have some handouts in the back too that have similar calculations. Yeah. Um, and this is just to point out, so you can see the amount of organic content, and then based on the amount of organic content, um, the fertilizer recommendations for nitrogen, you can see if you have high amount of organic matter, you don't, they're not recommending you would need any extra nitrogen. Um, but if you have lower organic matter, you might need to add more nitrogen, especially if you have heavy nitrogen using crops like potatoes or the or cauliflower or broccoli. The point there is add more organic matter to your soil. <laughs> um, and then you can do side dressing. So that's kind of like that very first picture where they added nitrogen a couple of different times throughout the season. So that's a good technique for your heavy nitrogen using crops like potatoes, broccoli, cauliflower. Um, so uh, a common side dress nitrogen source would be ammonium sulfate or ammonium nitrate because they're going to be quick releases. They're already in the available form for the plant. As soon as you put them down and throw some water in, they're going to be available for your plants. Uh, an organic option is fish powder. It's a water soluble fertilizer, and that tends to be um, more available com compared to all the other organic fertilizers that I can find anyway. Um, you can see in this picture just a symptom of low nitrogen where the, the lower leaves are getting a little yellow. And then phosphorus and potassium, these pictures are showing phosphorus uh, deficiency. So purpling of the leaves can be a good indication. But generally, we have enough phosphorus and potassium in our soils up here. Um, but especially if you're adding compost or manure, you're getting plenty of that in those in those. Uh, ingredients. If you do want to add it though, it's not a bad idea to incorporate it a little bit in the soil. So real quick questions you want to ask before you fertilize, you know, what do I need? Hopefully your soil test will tell you how much do I need to apply. A soil test can also tell you what type of material do I want to use. If you really want to use organic, you want to think ahead um, and continue to build your organic matter. Um, and know that it's just going to be a slow release fertilize over time. Uh, and then, yeah, think about when the best time to apply and what's your return on your investment. Maybe if you're a gardener, it doesn't really matter because you're not buying that much, but maybe it does matter. So that's why it's important to, yeah, just think ahead, plan ahead before you just throw some fertilizer down. Ballpark of what the soil test costs. A soil test costs like, I think it's like 35 or $40. Okay. And relative to the cost of fertilizer or amendments, it's it's worth it. Yeah. So it's it's worth it. Usually it's just feels like you it might be a hassle to to take the sample and send it in, but it's really easy. I think you're up here. Yeah. Tip number five. Number five. And so af and after five, all all the tips are kind of a package. So it's gonna go go pretty quickly. So uh, tip five, amend and mulch with what is available locally. So kind of back to the point of if you have, uh, you know, alpaca or llama, you know, cattle yard, horse stables nearby, um, use, use what's available locally. Um, so whether that's compost, manure, wood chips, biochar, pine straw. So pine needles like in, um, in pine plantations in the southeast. They harvest, they rake up the pine needles and sell them as pine straw. So um, there is value to those pine needles. Leaves or grass, again, green or brown, depending upon what you're looking for. And then also blood, hair, and urine. Uh, great topics to talk about, but 
um, like that slide that had the blood meal, um, usually byproduct of byproduct of animal slaughter or like feather meal. Um, they are high in nitrogen and it's relatively quickly available. So if you want to have an organic amendment, supply nitrogen quickly. So fish meal, blood meal, feather meal are, are very available quickly. Hair, even human hair has high nitrogen content. Um, you just have to make sure that it doesn't get like matted down because we all know that that can be gross when you're pulling stuff out of the, the shower drain. Um, but even, you know, I've contacted barber friends of mine and used, used hair as a mulch. Um, Do you use like dog or cat hair? Yeah, you certainly could. Oh, cat oh yeah. Right. <laughs> Right. So, so you just have to be careful with if there's anything like on the hair, you know, if you are getting it from a barber shop that doesn't have a lot of chemical treatments or things on it, um, you know, it's relatively free of pathogens or anything like that. Um, and then also, also urine. So kind of back to the, the soil men um, of the past used to, you know, collect uh, urine or, or feces from, from cities, and then they would go to and dump them out in agricultural areas. Um, you know, a lot of uh, you know, like vitamins, minerals um, that we process that we need are excreted in in our waste, and so they can be reused again if it's at uh, a correct level. So tips six through ten, the soil health principles. These were developed by the USDA. Uh, in particular, NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, um, to improve the health and function of the soil. So um, number one, minimize soil disturbance. So that's things like soil compaction and tillage. Maximize crop diversity. So this goes back to the point of uh, different crops, different plants use different uh, nutrients at different rates and it might be available uh, or needed at different points of the season. Um, it also could be depths within the soil, so shallow rooted versus uh, deep rooted. There's keeping the soil covered, so you want to maintain um, some type of mulch, whether organic or inorganic, organic is always much better, um, to keep the soil covered because there's been hundreds of studies on on like the soil temperature and the soil function if you have bare soil versus covered soil. So whether that's living cover, um, you know, like a green manure, clover, whatever, uh, or it's an organic, uh, you know, mulch, um, you want to keep it covered, keep it protected, uh, and also protect it from, from erosion. You don't want to lose whatever amendments you're applying and as the soil is developing, you don't want to lose any of that. You want to maintain a living root year round. So those plants are solar energy collectors. So they're taking the sun's energy and whenever they're alive, they're pumping carbohydrates and enzymes into the soil. So we've, we've been um, able to show that plants can control the ecosystem around them in the soil column based on what their needs are. So if they need more phosphorus, they might be able to pump these root exudates and these carbohydrates into the soil to incentivize those microbes that make the phosphorus available to them. And then I can also disincentivize things that they don't want growing. So the longer that you're able to maintain a living root in the soil, which could mean planting multiple successions of crops, planting cover crops, using perennials, all those things that have the plant collecting solar energy and pumping it underground, uh, the more you can do that, the better. And then also integrating livestock is the last one. It started out as these four, and then as we understand kind of the processes above ground and below ground, they added the integration of livestock. And we'll cover each of those in a little more detail. So minimizing soil disturbance, tillage, for some growing methods, it's needed. Um, for some regions, it's needed. But if you can avoid tillage or minimize tillage, 
um, that's always always beneficial. So this reduces water erosion, wind erosion, the ponding of water, so the, the creation of, of hard pans that it's basically a bathtub, especially in high clay soils. Um, and then along with that crusting. So if you have bare soil and you have uh, either, you know, any kind of precipitation, but particularly rainfall, uh, it disturbs the soil and then it stratifies. So kind of like your salad dressing in the fridge or something, um, based on the density and the particle size, those soil particles will stratify and it can form a crust over the surface that prevents uh, seedling emergence. Um, and also it can, uh, again, uh, lead, lead to ponding at the surface. And then also depletes soil organic matter. So by turning over the soil, you're, you're killing a lot of stuff, which then breaks down very quickly. So um, a lot of farmers, they till to incorporate the crop residue that might be on the surface because it breaks down very quickly. But again, all that, that carbon on the surface and below ground, that's the energy source for the soil. That's what the microbes use. And then that's ultimately what the plant relies on for making those nutrients available to them. Tip seven, plant diversity. So again, things like crop rotation, so heavy feeders, light feeders for different um, macro and micronutrients, uh, pathogen life cycles, so um, breaking up the life cycles that might be present um, in the immediate area in the soil. Um, diverse types of plants, so you're extending, again, that time that plants are able to take up um, the solar energy. So warm season, cool season, grasses, legumes, plant families all have roles within this ecosystem, both above and below ground. And it benefits the, the soil food web. So it's, it, you know, it, we want to create jobs. We want a healthy economy underground benefiting that soil food web. You want to keep soil covered. So cover crops, perennial plants, mulch. So this reduces erosion. This improves water infiltration, um, reduces evaporation. So if you have uh, if you have soil that is able to take in the water, but it's uncovered, the capillary force of that evaporation is going to literally suck. It sucks the water out of the soil. But if you can break that with a mulch, then um, you, can, you can prevent that loss of water, even if you're growing a cover crop. So if you have a cover crop, there's, I've heard the argument, which has been disproven multiple times, if you have a cover crop, well, it's taken water out of the soil. So when I plant it, it'll be less water for my crop. No, if you have the soil covered, that will leave more water in the soil for your plant. It'll improve the activity um, and longevity of the soil. Maintaining living roots. So you want to maintain a living root in the soil as long as possible. So this could be back to Jennifer's point, having natives that are more tuned to the seasonality where we are, um, planting perennials. So um, they have uh, that carbohydrate stored underground. So when it's ready for them to grow, they can tap into that grow and capture that energy <clears throat> and pump that solar energy underground. Cover crops, again, so you if you harvest something and if you're not planning on planting it to another crop you're gonna harvest, maybe sprinkle some cover crop seed, maybe some legumes that are going to fix more nitrogen that you can then either, um, you know, incorporate into the soil or you can just let winter kill. So you, when you're selecting cover crops, you want to make sure that they're not going to be a, a weed problem the next season if you don't terminate them. Or you at least have plans in your growing season to terminate it. And there's various methods to do that. Um, again, I, I and I know I'm being repetitive, but it's important for the plants to capture that solar energy, which we have a lot of in Colorado, and pump that underground where the microbes can use it. They will grow and die, and that'll improve your soil over time. And then tip number 10, integrating livestock. So 
This one, some people don't even include because they might, um, you know, they might be vegetarian or they don't have access to, you know, to livestock that what they would consider livestock so that they don't include it. But it doesn't have to be on site. So if, if you have it locally or if you have to go to a big box store, um, that's fine. Adding uh, manure or urine, allowing chickens to scratch through gardens in the fall and spring. I raised a flock of uh, lame ducks um, and they turned grasshoppers, which I really hated, into a lot of great fertilizer. So they can for, they can serve multiple purposes in that system. It could be a yard or it could be, you know, 160 acres. Uh, grazing animals, big or small. So again, could be cows, could be sheep, could be rabbits, could be guinea pigs, could be, could be anything. <clears throat> or even vermicompost. People raise worms as livestock. Um, so using those livestock to do some of the work for you. So it's composting, it's making those nutrients more available to plants once you apply that to your garden or growing area. So I know that was really fast, but these are the 10 tips for soil health. And if you follow these within reason, you will have better results. So soil test, soil test, soil test. Am I lazy and have I grown without doing a soil test? Yes, but I have been surprised so many times by soil tests, whether it's the pH, whether it's the availability of a certain nutrient that I assumed was deficient um, based on, you know, like the web soil survey or what I've been taught by experts like me. I'm, I'm not always right. You know, I'll, I won't make a joke about my wife telling me that, but... <laughs> Um, I'm not always right. And we, we learn more, especially about soil, every year. So there's more studies showing the complex interactions in, in the soil. Uh, increasing organic matter for various reasons, paying attention to pH and the electron, electrical conductivity, the EC, fertilizing with the right amount at the right time. And that kind of goes with um, you know, using organic fertilizers versus synthetic and their availability. Use local mulches and amendments whenever possible, both because it's cheaper and it's more sustainable. And it creates not only those communities underground, but you can tie into that information in within your community. Minimize soil disturbance, uh, maximize plant diversity, keep soil covered, maintain living roots, and then lastly, integrating livestock in whatever capacity you're willing and able to do. Um, so at this point, if you guys have any questions, we'd be happy to, to answer them. Uh, I have my card back there on the table and we have some few, uh, few handouts. Like I mentioned before, um, the extension website has more information than you could ever read in your lifetime. Um, so it just takes a little bit of digging uh, to find it. But if you have a question uh, about growing in Colorado, someone has probably asked it before and CSU Extension has has tried to answer it as accurately um, at the time as they could. So um, thanks again for coming. And yeah, any questions, we welcome you. We have a question on Monday. The at-home soil test kits versus sending your soil to the lab. Oh, okay. So the soil test kits, depending upon the soil, can be fairly accurate, but they're very limited, um, often in what they look for. Uh, and there's lots of variables with the test kits. So the, the moisture of the soil, when you take the sample, uh, how long you let the soil sit before you sample or before you test it. Often you add water and do like a, there's test strips, you know, kind of like pH strips or, you know, like pool strips, that kind of thing. But for taking the soil, the accuracy, just, just send it into a lab. It's really easy to, to find instructions for taking the sample and how to, how to send that into the lab. Yeah. So if I have 
a lot of questions. Um, but if you have raised gar raised beds, should you be testing them periodically as well? Yeah, um, you, uh, it would be best, ideally, if you could test every bed every season. Am I going to do that? I don't expect people to do that. But especially if you're adding amendments, uh, it's good to know maybe every other year, you know, maybe do half your beds one year, half the other, the, the next, um, just so that you know if what you're doing is having an impact. Um, so I used to work at a, a conservation tree nursery and the pH was extremely high, very, very high. And so they added sulfur every year based on the recommended rate to get the pH where they needed it. They kept adding sulfur, adding sulfur, adding sulfur to bring that pH down. Um, there's a sweet spot for about 20 years where trees were growing great. And then they started declining it again. And they say, oh, we're, we're not adding enough sulfur because the pH is creeping back up again. Because the soil has buffering capacity, it resists large changes in the pH, which can be a good or a bad thing. So they kept adding more sulfur. Here it is like 40, 50 years later, the pH was three. So they're trying to grow trees, pine trees, in a soil that blueberries can't even tolerate. So it's important to know if you're adding something, especially consistently, um, to sample intermittently so that you have a better understanding of, of what impact that, that's having. So, you know, do you have to do it every year? But some sample is better than no sample at all. So do what you can afford, what you 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 know you can tolerate for your time and things like that. Yeah, and then and then kind of back to the the question: a home soil sample test is better than none at all. But you, for again, for for the price and how much effort it is, just send it into a qualified lab, and you might you might be surprised. All right. I don't think we have any other questions online and looks like everyone's ready to stand up and get out of here. So thank you all for coming. Happy spring. Um, feel free to reach out if you have specific questions and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.